Just past 12 noon here on Wednesday, April 3rd. Happy Hump Day. I'm Bobby Trossett, as always, joined by my co-host and partner, Sarah Ellison, here inside the vault. Glad you're with us for this Ravens Lunch Hour live stream. Lots to get to today over the course of the next hour. Partner, we'll begin with, is it deserving? Is Lamar Jackson deserving? And the Ravens, are the Ravens deserving of some skepticism surrounding the word architect? Is that the specific word that was used at the owners' meetings? That, yes. To, to look at Lamar? Skepticism of, on, on if you would be a like legitimate architect in the office. All right. Yep. We're going to dive into that. I know you've been all over that. And I've been all over the blockbuster trade that just took place within the last hour or so that sends Stefan Diggs out of Buffalo to the Houston Texans. Texans continue to expand and stack their roster offensively uh, around their second-year QB now, C.J. Stroud, who we knew and, and know lit up the league a year ago. We'll also take a look at whether or not J.K. Dobbins was potentially brought in to the Kansas City Chiefs for a visit yesterday as leverage to get another deal done. And also the Baltimore Ravens West, if you will, continues to uh, get stacked up out there in L.A. with Jim Harbaugh. So why don't we begin with the topic that you've been diving into uh, over the course of this morning, and that is some comments made from last week's owners meetings by John Harbaugh and some of the blowback. I don't know if that's, that's a strong word, but some of the response. Yeah, 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 yeah the, response. the reaction to it. Yeah, a little reaction and all that. So. Um, I always find it interesting that national television shows on different networks on the same day start discussing the same topic. Now, if it was right after the game, of course, they're going to hit the same topic. But they happen to bring up his comments from last week on the same day. And just uh, before we get to their reaction, let's just remind everybody what John Harbaugh said from the owners meetings when he was talking about the offense and Lamar Jackson's involvement with it this offseason. And uh John said that, well, Lamar's got a lot of thoughts. I think he's looking at every aspect of his game. So he, he just kind of goes off saying bef Lamar is always looking inward first. Okay. Always looking inward, which is the way it should be, right? We all look at what we can control. But then he says, after that, he looks outward. He goes, so then he looks at what we need, what we need schematically in his view. And he trusts his coaches. We talked and shared ideas schematically, also personnel wise. So Harbaugh is putting out there. Uh, from my take is that it's like this hundred foot kind of picture at, at what they're doing with schemes. Uh, now, now that they're in the second year and obviously a Derrick Henry is being added, but also he got his opinions on personnel wise. Now we've talked about this before. Uh, we've seen evidence that Lamar has spoken up on the wide receivers he gets and the Ravens while not being able to follow through on all of them has gotten a lot of the receivers. He told them that they like to, I mean, from Hollywood to, Zay to OBJ. Um, I think uh, Hopkins is the one that, that he didn't end up getting. So they talked about schemes and personnel wise. Then he says, we're working on that now. And then he'll come back and he'll look at everything and I'll want to know what he thinks. So anybody that's thinking that Lamar is in the lab with Munkin drawing up the X's and O's, like in building it out, that, that is not what Harbaugh is describing here. He's saying, I talked to him first got his input, went to Munkin and the coaches. The offense is kind of, the offensive coaches are implementing that. It wouldn't surprise me if Munkin's spoken directly to Lamar also. And then they build it out and then they take it back to Lamar and get his input again. So I don't, he's not like in the lab with them. It doesn't sound like. So when he comes back and lets him know what he thinks, Har Harbaugh says like, do you prefer this or that? Or are you comfortable in this direction or that direction? What do you like? Are there any ideas you had since we last talked? Then he says, Lamar will be part of the architecture. I believe he'll be a big part of the architecture of the offense. Mm -hmm. So it's that quote at the end, a big part of the architecture of the offense that um, people were kind of discussing on national shows yesterday. So I pulled a couple clips from two different shows. One was speak for yourself. And then one was um, uh, up in Adams. Cause because uh, she had an interview that was very interesting. So uh, let's start with James Jones over at Up and Adams. They ask him, hey, what do you make of all this that Lamar is going to be a big part of the architecture? Nothing. Oh, this, this, this means absolutely nothing. The offensive coordinator is going to call the plays. Todd Munkin, that's his name? Yep. He is going to call the plays. Will Lamar be like, hey, man, these are some of my favorites? Sure. 
this offense is not going to change. So if we expect, oh, Lamar going to have some input, this offense is going to change? <clears> no. <throat> this offense is going to look the same way it did last year. They ran the ball the most out of anybody in the regular season. We wanted them to run it in the postseason. They might run it a little bit more in the postseason. But playing with Aaron Rodgers, Mike McCarthy was going to call his offense. Now Aaron Rodgers would come in there and say, hey, man, y'all get in here, receivers. These are the five plays I like. Y'all give me five of the plays that you guys are really comfortable with. Mm. Not no different crazy plays, just on Mike's radar to, hey, man, we really like these plays. You may like some other ones. We are really comfortable with these plays. Let's run these. But seeing an offense change just because you think he's going to have no input, no. It is not going to be like that. It will be some things, hey, coach, man, I'm really comfortable running these pass plays. Sure, let's get, let's get to those a little bit more. But him just putting his stamp on it and being able to design plays and all that, none of that is happening. So as a Baltimore fan, if you think that's happening, you're going to see the same offense. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's stop there. LaShawn McCoy has a different view, but... Your thoughts on what James Jones said? He basically says these comments that Lamar is going to be a big part of the architecture. He says this really means nothing. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, my my first thought is like, this is a former player speaking. He understands what, and, and he understands the context sometimes of what these comments can can mean from from a media standpoint or the way that they're overblown or underblown. You name it. Do I think that Lamar is going to be like heavily, heavily involved in like the nuance? No. I think this is a way of John Harbaugh uh, making it known to Lamar through the media. Not like he needs to do that because they have a great relationship internally, but all, also making it known that Lamar is here for, he hopes that Lamar is in Baltimore for the rest of his career. He's going into year seven. He's on the mega deal. And when they told him, and Todd mentioned last year when he came in as first-year offensive coordinator in Baltimore and gave him the keys, that to me was like a great sign of, sure, respect, but like you're, you're our guy. You're our quarterback. You're our point guard. Does that mean he's like heavily involved in the, the – like, like James is saying, like the, the nuance, the specifics of scheme? I don't believe so. But I think it's a great way of, uh, of showing – you know, you're, you're tipping the cap to, to somebody who you now, now know is a two-time MVP, somebody who you ride with, and you ride, wherever he goes, the Ravens go. And so to me, it's it, I guess I'm kind of with James in the sense that, to me, this is more about the relationship and, and what Lamar means to, to the team itself, more so than taking it literally. Yeah, so uh, for me, I think what James is – there was he's he kind of brushes over it. he's like do i think that lamar's going to come in and say hey i like these plays and here's what i like he's like yeah i think that that's going to happen uh to your point getting it like like i said i don't think he's in the lab that being said i'm not all the way there with james in terms of saying this means absolutely nothing and that's what he's like if you th- cuz that's, that's what he probably saying, this means nothing right <laughs> so now does but but yeah, like I said, I don't think he's in the lab with with uh, Munkin. Now, LaShawn McCoy, here's what's interesting about this. So Jesse, Jesse Jones, or James Jones, I said Jesse Jones, James Jones just spoke from a firsthand experience that he related. This is what happened in Green Bay. Mike McCarthy really didn't implement much of what we said. He did a little, but not a lot. Now, McCoy, McCoy on the other hand, um, McCoy, on the other hand, has a different experience. So he's like, I don't know. Like, here's what happened when I was in Tampa Bay. <laughs> but I do love the fact that they're giving him the option to help out, right? To to make a player comfortable. The, the most important player on a football team is the quarterback. Yes, sir. You make him comfortable, that's, that's all the, the, the right ways to win. That takes me back to Tampa when you were talking about Aaron Rodgers and uh, up and down 2020 when a championship with, with uh, Tom Brady and the Bucks. It was up and down with the offense. Guys are injured, you know, up and down, trying to find a new offense. He's been somewhere for 20 years with the Patriots, comes to a new team, so it's a new offense for him. But when we start really clicking, the bye week is when Brian Leftwich, the office coordinator, and Bruce Arian, the head coach, and Tom Brady, they, they got together, right? Because it was a lot of that, hey, it's my offense type of thing. And Tommy's more laid back or whatever, you the coach. But when they got together and said, listen, these are the plays I want to run. This is the style I want to play at. Can we mix up what you do special as Tom Brady and then as the coach, Bruce Arians, and Brian Leftwich, let's do it together. 
And that's when we started clicking. So I do think it will help the Ravens offense, give me what Lamar Jackson likes and loves. Look at Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid. Andy Reid, the way he coaches his all right, so then he talks about how Andy Reid kind of did that for uh, Mahomes in um, in Kansas City. So they're both speaking from a personal experience. And so what I think, Bobby, at the end of the day, this all is, I, is I think that it comes down to the coach. And, and um, I don't think there's any doubt that the personalities and the openness between Greg Roman – versus Todd Munkin is night and day. Like, like Greg Roman is just like, his personality is just already so like rigid and, and dry. Closed. It feels closed. <laughs> like it's not, yeah. he's not at yeah. ease. It feels like he's productive. So anyway, that's why I found, and I believe, I believe Deshaun Jackson here, he was on the up and Adam show and it, it just, she re brought it up. Cause she was like, Hey, when I was, uh, there was so we saw her right her sh her show was like nonstop running and there was so much content that she had and she's like but once this architecture um comment kind of came up it made her remember this passing comment from Deshaun Jackson to uh Terrell Owens on her show and they were talking about Lamar but he kind of slipped this this and in there. Deshaun said flat out that the Ravens didn't give Lamar the necessary freedom, like I'm talking about, the control to audible, to do what he does best. Uh, and, and it's worth a listen. Take a look. They're not allowing him to go to the line of scrimmage no, be like a Tom freedom, Brady to or play. Patrick Mahomes. Right. They're trying to control that. Bro. I get that. I don't know, like I said, I don't know. Like so you expect him to go out. You, you expect him to get under the center and see it. To your check, point, run. To your point, like the RPOs is what right. we're discussing. Right. I like I said, I don't know how much leeway that they like you're talking about. Him, right. They're giving him to go up and if he has but why? Or he sees, but why? I, I don't know. You have to ask. Coach Harbo, that no, mm. he knows. I, I, it's Todd Munkin. It's not. Coach, I played last there last. Deshaun's got history with Todd. It's not. Hardball. He doesn't have nothing to do with the offense. Oops. Yeah. So I thought I I for sure think this is based on the coordinator. I, I believe Deshaun Jackson that Lamar didn't have a massive voice, um, but I believe there's plenty of evidence, including from Lamar himself, that that changed with the entrance of Munkin. Yeah. So remember when Munkin got here? They were at OTAs training camp. Lamar said, Todd Munkin is giving us the keys to the offense and letting us do our thing. That's pretty much helping us a lot as well. Then later he talked about, remember, he, he said he gave, uh, he, he looked up, he had plays from social media and yeah, then he too. gave them to, to uh, uh, T. Martin and then Martin sent him to Munkin and then he's like, and it was in the offense today. He's like, it was in practice. We were running it. Um, Marlon Humphrey talked a lot about how Lamar's changed and he felt he had contributed to like Lamar's contract, um, in that sense. But, but the point is all last year, we heard more and more and more from coaches, but from Lamar himself and his teammates about how he did have a bigger voice. And then it wasn't just a, in leadership. It was in the offense. Right. So, and then the last thing I'll point to of, of evidence of it, but people didn't like hearing this. Uh, but when John Harbaugh was asked, you know, why don't you guys run more in the AFC championship game? And he said, it's more than just calling plays in that game. A big part of our game plan were RPOs, which are run pass options based on what the defense gives you. Uh, cans and check with me's, which are run pass options a lot of the times. Sometimes they're pass to pass, which we had. Sometimes they're run to run. But a lot of what we were doing was directed at the line of scrimmage. So anyway, my point being, do I think he's in the lab building the offense from, from top to bottom? No, and that's not his job. That would be too much to put on Lamar, way too much for Lamar. His job is to play quarterback. He's going to have a voice on, on what wide receivers do, right? He'll go up to his teammates yep. and say, Zay, this is what I like. And Zay will listen, but at the end of the day, Zay's the wide receiver. He's got to do his job. At the end of the day, the offensive line has to do their job. they got to listen to what Lamar likes, but at the end of the day, they got to do their job. Same with Todd Munkin. He he needs to absolutely build this offense around Lamar and get his voice, but at the end of the day, he's the offensive coordinator, and it's his job to be the true architect. And so how much Lamar's voice is in there, I think depends both on Lamar and the offensive coordinator's ability to listen and then implement 
which I think Todd Munkin is evidently better at doing than Greg Roman once was. This time last year, remember we were talking about words like autonomy, freedom, creativity, keys, yes. keys right? Yeah. Like all of these things that that we thought and ended up, it certainly ended up becoming true that Lamar would be able to have at his arsenal, at his disposal within this new scheme, within this new relationship with Todd Munkin. Well, little did we know that there were more layers to that too. And like you you got me thinking about the relationship away from the field, whether it's in the stuff, whether it's in the film room, whether it's in the building, whether it's in office meetings, one-on-one, whatever that it, that might look like between Todd and Lamar. You're mm-hmm. right. Greg, Greg didn't come across externally and based on what we've heard from so many different Ravens, both still with the team and, and externally like, like Deshaun Jackson, it didn't feel like there was an openness there with Todd. Like it, it's, it, it's as if it's there's an expectation DNA. it's in his DNA. We know yeah. that, that that's his personality for sure, but it's almost like there's an expectation that I want you to challenge me. I want you to bring ideas and plays and, and different r- related pieces to what you think and what you believe and what your, what your strengths are that ultimately will help us win. And, and with that openness, I think it w- it's, it's been rejuvenating for these guys. It's probably been liberating in a lot of ways. So little did we know there'd be a li- there'd be almost like a, a two way street in a sense with the on field stuff, but also, what we don't get to see a lot of times or we don't get to hear about. And that's these relationships that are being cultivated in the building. So good stuff there. Stefan Diggs. Yeah. And before we do this episode is brought to you by our friends at Manta sleep. And if you want to improve your sleep, if you want to take your sleep to the next level, Manta sleep is a great way to do so. They got all kinds of different sleep masks that they provide, which give you 100% blackout for a deeper sleep. You have C-shaped eye cups, as you see on the screen here, for unbeatable side sleep comfort. Zero pressures applied on your eyelids or lashes. You got advanced materials included with ventilation for unmatched breathability. And just because I always like to bring out mine, where are you? Which which kids have yours at this point? Uh, Aiden, Lennon, and Ella have the three that I have that we own. (laughs) And you're just fresh off your vacation. You were saying yesterday that they all brought them. It's it. They're easy. They're mobile, portable, and one of them doesn't. Aiden have the Bluetooth built yep, into it. <laughs> he sure does. I love it. It's got a little bit of everything. Whether it's for your kids, whether it's for you, whether it's for cat naps, whether it's for deep sleep. If you use code Vault Ten at checkout, there's a link that we have included in the show notes below. By the way, if you use code Vault Ten, that's V A U L T one zero, you'll get ten percent off your next purchase. So a huge shout out. Demand to sleep for sponsoring our channel here in this off season. We're getting ready for the draft. And as we saw last year, there can be a lot of activity either on draft day or prior to draft day, Sarah. And that's exactly what happened today, just about an hour or so ago between Buffalo and Houston. ESPN's Adam Schefter breaking the news of a blockbuster. The bills are finalizing a trade to send four time pro bowl wide receiver, Stephon Diggs to the Houston Texans for draft pick compensation. Here are the specific details. We'll get back to this slide in just a second because the Texans, as you see here, based on what they've done this offseason, based on what they did last year under a rookie QB and CJ Stroud are stacked. At least they are on paper. But Albert Breer had the trade terms more specifically. So the Texans get Stephon Diggs, a 2024 sixth and a 2025 fifth. The Bills get a second round pick in 2025, and that comes from Minnesota. Now, here's here's the key here. This, this is what's kind of jaw-dropping in terms of the monetary side of how the Bills have to move forward now. The Texans are going to inherit digs just over $19 million in cash for this year, 2024. Uh, $18.5 million base is fully guaranteed. And he has a $250,000 workout bonus and a 255 k in per game roster bonuses. Uh, the Bills have over $43.8 million in dead money to work through, Sarah. They wanted them out of the building so badly that they were willing to eat a decent amount of cash. And, and we always kind of defer to Brian McFarlane when it comes to all things cap. His reaction, wow, this is pretty crazy. Diggs was set to count 27 million plus 
on the bill's cap, but now will count $31 million plus in dead money. So they're taking on an additional $3.24 million to trade him for a second-round pick that's not even later this month. You're not going to see that second-round pick until this time next year in the 2025 draft. So as Brian finishes up this tweet on X, says they really, really wanted him gone, Sarah. I I really don't know. Did he did he also have wear out his time in Minnesota? Like, Stefan has there? never really left an organization on good terms. Okay. So yes, yeah. and he definitely wore his time out in Buffalo. And one more little nugget here before you get your full reaction. Jason at over the cap added on to this. Bills are going to carry about thirty one point one million in dead money for Diggs. Pretty much a disaster extension for them. Remember, they extended Ooh. them. They extended them. When? W- wound up paying. Uh, right before 2022. Yeah, check, check that. If I you got could. it. Right right here. 2022. Yeah. Okay. Within the last two years. Wound up paying an extra $20.9 million in 22 and 23 Bro. to come away with a net of less than a second rounder next year. Woof. That, exactly. Exactly. And that, to Brian's point shows you just how disgruntled he may have been, just how disgruntled the organization was with him, and now he heads to Houston and again to your point leaves on poor terms. Yeah, I don't I don't know all the background. I mean, obviously we're watching it from the outside looking in. It does seem like Stefan's rarely happy. Uh, you know, rarely pleased with what's going on and uh you know, which, you know, what wide receiver doesn't want the ball? Uh, but it's interesting just to like, you look at the wide receivers in Baltimore last year, they all got low numbers, right? That's what we just talked about yesterday. Bateman didn't get a lot of numbers. OBJ didn't get a lot, likely didn't get a lot until Andrews goes down. Aguilar, who, you know, wasn't promised anything, but, you know, he didn't get a lot. So, uh, but never a peep. Never a peep. And and you'd think, well, if you're winning, that makes it feel better. But the Bills were a playoff team. You know, they they had just as much of a chance yeah. as anybody else to, to go Absolutely. all the way. So um, so I don't know the background. I don't know if his complaints are deserving or not, but from the outside looking in, when you are willing to carry <laughs> $31.1 in dead money. Are you kidding me? Right. That is like, we do not we do not want you. As good as you have been, we do not want you. That is a, that is a $31 million statement of, we, we can't do this anymore with you. Exactly. And that is the perfect segue to, to, to a reaction to some of the comments that I've seen, not necessarily on this live chat, but on X in particular about why Eric DaCosta wouldn't be willing to give up a second. Oh, you need some context on that. They're not willing to take on that ridiculous cap hit for an aging player, for a disgruntled player, for someone who, hey, for his sake, I hope he goes and balls out in Houston. We'll get to what what the Texans are looking like right now on paper for 2024. They could be very dangerous. In the first half of last year's divisional round game, they looked very dangerous. Now, the Ravens didn't play a great first half, and then they ended up making a bunch of halftime adjustments. The rest was history. But to be where they are through one year of C.J. Stroud, Sarah, they're putting on – I saw Cole Jackson tweet this. I couldn't agree more. They're putting on an absolute clinic organizationally for how you take advantage of a dynamic rookie quarterback still on that first contract. They are building around him. They nailed – The second overall pick a year ago, we know Bryce Young went first overall to Carolina. Hasn't worked out for him yet. Big rebuild going on with the Panthers. We'll see how that that goes. But when you nail the quarterback on his rookie deal, then you can start stacking. And that's what they've done this offseason. Well, it's funny because I'm not reading the comments, but I could just imagine – Ravens fans being like, well, why didn't, why didn't the Ravens do that for Lamar? Well, he was on his rookie contract and they, they did spend money, but not at wide receiver, <laughs> no. No. not at wide receiver. And you know, the Ravens spend money because they're always tied up against the cap. So anybody calling him cheap is wrong. It just means that they're, they're yeah. cheap at certain positions for sure. 
So that's what that's what people are really pulling their hair out. To me, that's that's the more valid thing to pull your hair out. If we're talking about today, right now, Ravens making this move in 2024. In no way did I have any expectations that the Ravens would go out and get Stefan Diggs. Is he worth the second rounder? Probably. Uh, do the Ravens have the cap space? Heck no. Going into free agency, the Texans had 50 million. That's why they can absorb a $20 million contract out of nowhere. They had 50 million. The Ravens had, at the same time that they had 50 million, the Ravens were under by 180,000. So um, Texans had the cap space. Um, when it comes to like, it's interesting when it comes to like, you had pointed to, well, there's no way Eric DeCosta was, was going to do it with this red flag. I mean, I don't know. There's some red flags. Like, well, what, you, Sorry, what, what red flag in, in particular? Well, the, I the, was the, talking about the, the, the cap hit. Right. You were, well, I thought you were saying that the, the bill's willing to absorb 31 million was the reason why, why EDC wouldn't go after him, but maybe you weren't saying that. Maybe you were just saying the Ravens didn't have 19 million. Is that what you were saying? I, I was saying the yeah the implica- cap implications, and then also just the red flag. Yes, that that the bill. So my point is like like for example, you were worried about OBJ a little bit, right? Like admittedly coming into it based mm-hmm. off of like his history and things not ending well. But then he comes here and he was phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Was just a top notch, classy teammate. At the same time, you look back on somebody like um, Antonio Brown, which had red flags, yeah. and he never he never really turned it around, right? He didn't have like a 180 the way OBJ did and just became this great teammate. In fact, he went and <laughs> him and Tom Brady even, uh, it wasn't great. So you 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 never After know. Tom if- opened up his door to let him <laughs> yeah. stay with him in Tampa, and then he just torches him all over online. Right, right. So whether Stefan Diggs will continue to – have another bad relationship with a new team, or if he becomes like an OBJ and it really was just a bad situation, you know what I mean? Like, I I don't know, time will tell. Uh, But for sure, the Bills couldn't get rid of him fast enough. So to me, my critique of EDC not making this move today, I never expected it. But I think there's a gripe that it's like, okay, to to your point and and Cole Jackson's point, okay, well, when Lamar was so cheap for five years, definitely for four, why didn't you then load up at quarterback and or at, at wide receiver. And, you know, when we were back at the time, we were looking at 2019, you're like MVP, best great offense. This is a running offense. You don't need to spend a lot of money on wide receivers. But now that the Ravens are becoming a little bit more pass friendly under Todd Munkin, now it's like now you could use them. Uh, but there's there was like there's no way the Ravens had room to absorb a $19 million contract. There's like yep. they could have they could have restructured in fact, it's but you have to look at it. It's not just 19 million this year. Like his contract, they absorbed the base salary for the next uh, four years. Yeah. So they got 2024, 2025, 2026, and 2027. Almost all those years are around 19 million until the last year. So even if the Ravens had restructured to fit him in this year, that means they just would have been pushing money for Lamar or Matt Abike or Mark Andrews or Humphrey or Ronnie Stanley. Well, not Ronnie because Ronnie took a pay cut already. Like it's just a legit pay cut. You move that all down there, but you still don't have room for to move all those guys and still keep the Stephon Diggs. So I don't see how it would have been possible now, but I think there's a greater gripe that you didn't you didn't load up on offense more on Lamar Jackson's rookie deal. It's hard to keep him happy, Stephon. And I'm I, look. This is a dude who, over the last four seasons, hasn't gone below receiving yards wise, twelve hundred yards, and has gone as high. As, oh, sorry, eleven hundred yards, and he's gone as high as fifteen hundred yards. That was back in twenty twenty. And so the, the guy is. We we know what he is as a player, but he caused so many headaches for the Buffalo Bills. A lot of which was online. Here comes one just from last night. RG3 tweeted out a, a bunch of stats on whether or not Stefan is essential to Josh Allen's success. That's what RG3 looked at in one of his YouTube videos. And a guy named the Peaky Pirate on X tweeted back at RG3 and said, does Josh benefit from having a top-tier receiver? Yes. Is he essential to his success? No. Stefan himself, Sarah, writes back, you sure? <laughs> the guy is... 
constantly caught. I don't want. I don't want my teammate. Now, at the time, they were teammates. Now, Stefan knew that today was happening. I'm sure, or at least had an inkling that he's not going to be in Buffalo this time next year. Um, but at the time, he, he's a teammate of Josh's. I don't want my teammate dragging me like that. Like Josh had never, this is what I respect about Josh Allen. Diggs made it so personal, made it cause so much of a ruckus online. And Josh always kept it in house or at least tried to keep it in house. That's tough. That's tough to, to, when you, when you weigh that, that risk versus reward and you take that kind of gamble by bringing somebody in house who's very historically very difficult to keep content, mm -hmm. to keep happy, even when they're winning. Right, Buffalo hasn't gotten to where they where they think they should be with all the talent that they have. And by the way, there's been a max mass exodus. Uh, Bills are going to look a lot different. They haven't just lost Diggs. Gabe Davis left in free agency. Tre'Davious White, Mitch Morse. I'm just looking at a bunch of other guys that left too in their in their secondary. It's going to look a lot different. But when you try to, when, when you're as a GM or anybody in that front office, when you start to weigh uh, all of these issues, man, I could see why they were like, yeah, we, we can't, this doesn't make sense. But what does make sense for Houston is the way they look right now. Take a look at the offseason additions. Diggs, of course, is the headliner. Daniil Hunter, Joe Mixon, who the Ravens know, knew well from his time in Cincinnati. Danico Autry, Jeff Okuda. C.J. Henderson, Tim Settle, Foley Fatukasi, Tommy Townsend. And again, that that joins Sorry, the likes we, we of... Threw, we, we threw the punter in on that list just to make it look longer. But it is a lot of significant names. I just laughed at the last one. I know, Shefty had to throw that one in there. But, yeah. but look at the, I mean, th these are already joining the likes of, of Dalton Schultz at tight end, Tank Dell at wide receiver, Nico Collins. And, and of course, you can't not mention... C.J. Stroud is coming off just a stellar, stellar rookie year. They're going to be a problem. They were already a problem. You know, <laughs> like the, the Ravens had to have like major adjustments and Lamar Jackson, like, you know, turned to angry Lamar going into the, the halftime. Right. And it looked like Texans were going to be a problem. And then finally, the Ravens in the second half of that uh, divisional game were able to turn it around. And so, um yeah, they already were a problem, and I think CJ Str – to me, it's all it, – there, there's no bigger impact on the playoffs of who's going to win than the quarterback position. Yeah. And with CJ Stroud there, that's massive. You got him uh, – you got him now a legitimate wide receiver, and if he's happy, that's going to help out a lot. If he's not, it could create turmoil turmoil for sure, and that would be tough to put a young quarterback in that position. But, yeah, Texans Texans are going to be a, a, a problem. And by the way, Bobby, I just want to be on record, and this, maybe I'm – it depends. It, it, listen, there was – again, there was no way. N clearing $19 million for this, the Ravens couldn't have done it. They're they're going to have to still restructure just to fit in their draft class, yeah. and 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 fill out some of the the edge room or the the yeah the edge uh, outside linebacker room. Like I legitimately don't think they could have done feasible. it and still yeah. get there and and still have and still have a little bit of money there for during the season for inevitable injuries and maybe do a trade in season. Like I, I literally don't think they could have done it. That being said, if he was at a smaller price. I think I would take a risk on Stefan Diggs, right? And maybe it depends on the background that you do. Like one of the reasons why the, the Ravens could be one of the reasons, not the only one of the reasons the Ravens could be comfortable with OBJ is Munkin was with them and Munkin be probably vouched for him. Right. So you would make phone calls. If you can find, if you can find, if there's, if there's some background, that's like, nah, he's a good guy. He's just misunderstood or yada, 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 or he's grown or this and that. If the price were right, I'd feel good about Stefan Diggs. You'd Oof. like, you'd be like, okay, I'm a little bit worried. Let's keep an eye on this. <laughs> yeah. But if, is it worth the risk at the right price? Sure. But at this yeah. price, it just uh, there, like, there's no way. Well, you're betting on your culture, right? At that you'd point, you're betting you're, on your culture. Yep. You're and, betting and, on and your the culture. culture can't overcome everything because as we just, we just uh, played from yeah. EDC with um, Earl Thomas, Earl Thomas. Listen, yeah. But there was there was like that. I don't know Stefan Diggs well enough to know like off the field stuff. I haven't heard of any off the field stuff, yeah. and so uh, to me it could be worth worth the risk. 
Uh, but you have to, but you'd have to do the homework to EDC's point. If yeah. you've done the homework, like if he had called around and they were like, nah, don't do Earl Thomas, then he could have avoided, you know, a, a big headache and losing out on quite a bit of money. Yeah. So you got to do the homework. But if, 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 if people are vouching behind for him behind the scenes, then, then take the risk, you mm. know, but if they're not, then yeah, you lay low. <laughs> You'd be betting on your culture, but guess what? If, if, if the, the cap stuff ended up working out and, and if it were even feasible, if Lamar said, yes, you probably have to do it. Yeah. Right. You'd probably have to do it. So. Well, and, and one last thing that I want to say about this, the other big reason why the Ravens wouldn't be on in on Stefan Diggs, put the money aside is they've already told us they're going forward with Zay and Bateman. Oh boy. They're going yeah, forward they with their two first round draft picks. I feel good about Zay. I feel so, so about Bateman, but yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, saying it's impossible for Bateman, but I'm, I'm okay on it. That's, that's why they're not in the market. They are moving forward with Zay and Bateman. They have told us that we're in denial. We don't like it, yeah. but that's what they're doing. Well, perhaps they have the luxury to do so when you have two star tight ends, one of whom is budding in, in Isaiah likely. Mm -hmm. And you have King Henry in the backfield now with the greatest rushing quarterback of all time. So perhaps they, are deserving of, of that luxury. We'll see. Time will tell. Before we continue the conversation, Sarah and I just wanted to remind you once more about our special event that's coming up later this month, April 25th, opening night of the 2024 NFL Draft. And at Soundstage in downtown Baltimore, Sarah and I are pleased to be hosting our first ever in-person marathon draft party live stream to celebrate opening night of the draft. It's a seven o'clock open door. 40 bucks gets you in. You got a cash bar. That 40 bucks will include premium tailgate buffet, courtesy of our friends at Clean Cuisine. If you can't make it in person, of course, it'll always be available via stream digitally on YouTube and X and any other platform that we can get it streamed up on. Sarah is flying in from Columbus, as we've mentioned. So can't wait to have you back in downtown Baltimore and tickets are available right now on Ticketmaster. Link is in the show notes below. We'd love to have you. Can't wait to have you back in the 410. Can't wait. This is That's the day the Ravens will be building. It certainly isn't today with Stefan Diggs. Yep. That is their building day. Yep, we know it. We know it well. How about this from yesterday? During our live stream, we kind of led with J.K. Dobbins' visit to the Kansas City Chiefs, the reported mm -hmm. visit. But then, not long after, they went ahead and re-signed Clyde Edwards-Hilaire, who's also running back to a one-year deal. So Isaiah Pacheco and now Edwards-Hilaire are in their running back room. And the first thought's like, well, wait, what happened to JK? Was it medical? Was it a bad visit? What happened? Well, Nate Taylor of The Athletic, who covers the Chiefs out in KC, uh, confirmed the deal. And as for J.K. Dobbins, he was told that his visit was productive for both parties, perhaps a partnership that could happen later this offseason. Now, you grabbed this from Chase Daniel, former NFL player. I'll let you take this because this was kind of my first thought. Uh, well, actually, my first thought before I saw anything was, oh, my gosh, where is his medical at? And mm. then the Edwards Hilaire tweet came out after. I'm like, oh, no, that's leverage. So what do you got here from Chase? Yeah, so Chase, he has, his, like you said, former NFL player, 14 years in the league, 13, 14, something like that, and has his own show now. And he writes, um, he, he quote retweets what we just showed up there um, from The Athletic. And then he goes, AKA, let's bring J.K. Dobbins in as leverage to make Clyde Edwards Alaire sign. Oh. And he goes on and says, I was that leverage in March of 2017 after I got cut by Philly. <clears throat> I was in Dallas and Jets flew me up first class to meet with them. And as soon as I got off the plane, my agent called and said, they signed Josh McCown to a six million dollar deal. Had the driver had the driver take us to Philly so we could move out of our house instead. <laughs> That's oh, life in the NFL. Man. So, um, would this surprise me? Absolutely not. Because. Wait, Agents. that's wild though. Sorry, I, I'm just reacting to this for the first time. That's a pretty wild life in the NFL <laughs> story for sure. You got hey, you got a first class <laughs> airplane ticket, and then you get to the you get to New York, and they're like, nope. And he's like, all right, take me to Philly. I'm gonna move out. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> 
<laughs> that is bananas. That is mm. seriously bananas. But um, but yeah, b- teams and agents do this all the time. You'll see. You'll see reports from Adam Schefter say, "Uh, hey, uh, like, like, think back when um, there were rumors that Hopkins was going to be traded, right? Yeah, DeAndre. And then somebody would report, hey, uh, the Ravens are interested, <laughs> and I'm just making up names now. Like the 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 Patriots are interested, and the Chargers are interested, and they'll name like four teams, right? Mm-hmm. And that's to try to make teams feel desperate. Well, here's the reverse of that." This is like, all right, we've been in talks with Clyde. Oof. We haven't we haven't moved, so let's bring in other people. Let's bring in other people and see if that kind of moves things. And with the timing of it, this is certainly a reasonable yeah. uh, conclusion to think that's what was going on is, is JK was being uh, used for leverage. And so um, now that make, puts him at, what, two visits now with um, the Chargers, who, by the way, have Ortiz and have Jim Harbaugh and have uh, Greg Roman. Oh, we'll get to who they have in just a second. <laughs> well, but 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 my point of bringing that up, not the player side, but the yeah. the decision making side. Sure, sure. So coaching and free agents, it's making some wonder. And I don't know. I I want so badly for J.K. to be healthy and have a great prove it year. Yeah. I want him to do what John Simpson did here. I want him to do what Ronald Darby did here and or Jadavian Clowney or Kyle Van Noy and just put on tape and said, look, don't count me out yet. That's what I want for JK. However, the fact that with all that inside knowledge of JK that the chargers haven't signed him yet, or they had him in for a visit and haven't signed him, that could still change. And KC had him in, he hasn't been signed. So there are questions about where he is at physically. Um, but you know, he put out that video looked, looked pretty good in his workout. Still looked like that calf was pretty small from my view. Um, so he's still out there. And for those that, I mean, yesterday, I know there are a lot of people who were angry. It looked like KC, especially with the way Adam Schefter voted it. Remember he said, it looks like he could have a home very soon or something like that. The The way he worded it made it seem like it was imminent. But now that, now that we now looking back, it's like, wait, could that have been KC side? kind of like feeding Adam yeah, that news. You know for what I mean? Sure. So, but for those that were angry and still wanted the Ravens to sign him, you know, this leaves it that there's still a chance. I don't think that they will. I think the Ravens are turning the page. Uh, and I, and I, but he's still out there. So there's a chance. Yeah, I think they are as well. And I think like we talked about yesterday at length might be best for, for both parties. Yeah. Next chapter. Speaking of those chargers though, They've continued to pluck and pry and recruit from the Ravens. They've signed former Ravens fullback Ben Mason, spent the majority of his time in Baltimore on practice squads. Um, I can remember he may have gotten some time during the COVID years, if I'm remembering correctly, when when, when sort of the you know the pandemic was was raging. But he's a Michigan man. So he played his you know, he played his college football for Jim Harbaugh in Ann Arbor, and now he's going to the chargers. Now the greater, the greater picture here is something that we've learned this off season. And that is a lot of former Ravens are joining the chargers, whether it be through free agency, the coaching staff or the front office, Greg Roman is going to be calling the plays. As you've mentioned, Gus Edwards left in free agency. Hayden Hurst, who's had a couple stops since being drafted in Baltimore was picked up this off season by LA Bradley Bozeman, who spent the last couple of years in Carolina is going to LA and then the aforementioned Ben Mason and one name not on this list that you mentioned as well is their new general manager, Joe Hortiz, who was a lifelong Raven and just got the GM, you know, the, 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 the call, right. He'd been waiting for the call or the right call for a long, long time. Uh, been with the organization since what was it? 98, something like that. So, uh, but he was under Eric DaCosta as the director of player personnel for the last handful of years. And so now it's looking like, uh, what do they call it again? Baltimore Ravens West, something like that. Baltimore Ravens West. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of former Ravens. It's not surprising. Like you, you bring people with you where you go. Although Mike McDonald yeah. hasn't done a lot of that. Mike has not. Mike has not whatsoever. If, yeah. if any, yeah, there's, there's been not a lot of movement there, <laughs> but we know the Harbaugh to Harbaugh tree, whether it be 
in the past, it's always been the coaches, right, from the college and, and NFL level, uh, some within that tree. But now that Jim's back in the NFL, you're starting to see it from a, the player side. Uh, yeah. But to be honest with you, like, there's been a lot of reaction to this, some of which just might be like emotional hyperbole type thing in the moment. But does any of these – do any of these moves af- upset you or – put your radar off like not for me not from a player side I mean Ben Mason probably fits better with Jim I mean he never really quite did it I mean did anything in Baltimore and I know that you know the Harbaugh parents like loved him and this and that and he obviously succeeded with Jim uh Bradley Bozeman uh, as a center I would like him back as a guard remember he played guard for a while he did Hayden Hurst, I think the Ravens are in a better position with likely and, uh, you know, Mark Andrews, Gus Edwards. I think the Ravens are better with Derrick Henry, Greg Roman, obviously. I think the biggest hit is is Ortiz. Right. That, Invis- that one Invisibly is. so. Yeah, I mean, I just feel like um, I distinctly remember Steve Bashotti giving an interview once about um, – how they hadn't drafted well for a couple of years. I'm trying to remember what stretch that was, mm-hmm. but he gave an interview where he talked about how many, like there were like four or five scouts that had been plucked from the scouting department. And he was like, we, we have to have, we have to refill the pipeline. He's like, we don't use, um, we don't use there's, there's, you can buy. I don't know why teams would ever do this. It's crazy to me that any team would do this, but they buy, somebody's um draft board and like their draft grades and all that kind of stuff and yeah. the ravens don't do that they they have their own models they have their own way of scouting and all that and so he just felt like you know it took some time to replace those guys so ortiz who's been by edc side since the beginning uh and is one of his good friends and uh i think he took over the draft once once edc was elevated to the gm role uh, so I think Ortiz out of all the signings that, that the chargers have had from Baltimore, I think that's the, that's the one that would hurt the most. You know, what's interesting about you just saying, taking over the draft. I don't doubt that Joe had a massive role, but one of the nuggets that I got from that 55 minute conversation that Eric had with, uh, the, the Penn, the former Penn state tight end, Adam Brenneman the other day, mm-hmm. he said that every year, every year that he's been general manager, he still runs the draft. And I found that to be mm-hmm. amazing. That's how much. He, he loves adores it. the draft. And then did you, did you hear towards the end? He was like, oh, once the draft's over, I sink into depression for multiple days. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't even know what to do until we get the guys in the building. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's real, though. Like, I know I feel that after the season's over and we just – we go – we kind of cut back our content a little bit. Like, that's a real thing um, from an adrenaline standpoint. So, but anyway, that's that. One more note here on – Matthew Judon, who <laughs> continues to garner some reaction. I just, it's funny, just, just a moment ago, I, I saw Raven live Ravens Nation on, on X put out a tweet that a CBS sports columnist lists the Ravens as a potential suitor for Judon. You know, one of those pieces that's just like a, a commentary type thing. Right. Which we did that a couple days ago. We did. Yeah. It, and it was from CBS sports, I believe. Anyway. No, what I, was it from CBS? Yeah, yeah, there were two different people that did it, but the one we cited was from CBS. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so it's the same gotcha. one. Yeah, yeah, Um. Anyway, it, I just saw the screen grab. So Nelson Aguilar had put up on Instagram on April 1st. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, a FaceTime that it looked like he was doing with Matthew Judon. And um, and then he, he posted that with the caption that says, uh, welcome back but then a laughing emoji and he, and he has charm city on his sweatshirt and all this kind of stuff. looks like they're talking. And so it kind of made a few rounds on Baltimore, but uh, my guess is, is that was a April fool's kind of like joke, putting that out there. And um, because he's on another team, so that would be crazy for, you know? Yeah. And if there was a trade that was eminent, it's been a couple of days by now, but I think that's just uh, Nelson playing with us. And if I'm wrong, that would be great. Because well, I would Judon was playing with everybody. I would love a reunion. What'd you say? Uh, sorry to cut you off. Judon was playing with everybody on on April first because he put up a retirement Instagram 
fool's you know april fool's day post and he said you know a whole little paragraph here and it was nicely laminated and everything it's hilarious he goes i'm unbelievably excited for the next stage well let me just read the entire thing because it okay. only takes a second here <laughs> i'm right. telling you this was like professionally done thank you patriot patriots nation for showing me so much love and support these past three years in new england i can honestly say that new england has become one of my favorite places on earth and it is all thanks to you the fans although this chapter is coming to a close I'm unbelievably excited for the next stage of my career, comma, competing in professional equestrian show jumping. And then you look, you go to the next slide and it's him in a cut sleeve looking like a denim cowboy with a cowboy hat on and a horse. I mean, the, the guy is, oh, he's he, fun. he is such a trip. He really, really is. He's fun. I would love to, I would love to have him back, but we'll see. My, my ideal scenario would be that you know, if he really is available, that he became, he would become a cap casualty, you know, yeah, post draft. Yeah. That would be, that would be nice. Yep. So Ravens need a veteran. That's for sure. They do. There's work to be done. They very, very much do. So, all right. All set. Any, uh, uh, super chats. Yes. Thank you. There is one from Dre dog. What's up? Dre dog. Wide receiver two should not be given to Bateman, uh, should not be, quote, given to Bateman. He needs to prove and earn that spot. And if he's not showing growth in the first four games, got to move on, period. Well, I don't think they're moving on from him in season. Well, but... maybe move on from wide receiver two. Oh, yeah. Maybe in okay. that sense. No, I I agree. I feel, like, I feel like we did this last year where people were up. There was – some people who were upset that it was like, why are you bringing OBJ and then Nelson? Like, this is your first round pick. Um, you know, he should be wide receiver too. And I remember one day like going off and being like, no, he's got to earn it. Like you can't be afraid of competition. That is what the NFL is all about. Like it's, it's competition at its highest level. You cannot be afraid of competition. And they brought in competition and they basically sp split targets, you know? And so the argument now is that, hey, he was ready on, on tape. He's always open, you know, or frequently open. But no, I'm with I'm with the commenter here. It's like, um, I'm with Dre Dog. I, I just, I don't feel like Bateman has earned a position where he's not competing for number two. I don't, I don't thousand percent uh, now I'm uh, again, I believe that Bateman has all the potential in the world, but at some point you got to realize that potential. And I've been saying, I would like to bring in somebody that will give him, you know, competition for it. Yep. And so far that hasn't happened, but, but September's a long way away. And day two, day two of the draft could come there. I mean, let's, let's, let's think about, uh, what draft? What round was Puka Nakua? You know, the guy that Sixth? guy just broke all kinds of records last year for the Rams. Like you can get value on yeah. day two, and dare I even say day three? So, you can, but in Baltimore, that feels like a faraway dream. It does. It because we're trying and to get exactly we're hit. trying to get Bateman, who's a first round pick. I think he was like twenty nine, something like that. Uh, we're trying to get first rounders to like realize potential, let alone find somebody in the sixth round. Yeah, they they don't hit. They don't hit on that position <laughs> no. in the wide receiver. Zay Zay hit. And Zay hit. Maybe Bateman will because they're giving him the keys to number two. They're gonna give him the keys. I can't imagine they're gonna give him the fifth year option. But nope. Let's see how things shake out. We are under a month away from that deadline decision day, May second. They have to either pick up or decline the fifth-year options of Rashad and Adafe Owe, respectively. So, all right. Appreciate you, Dre Dog. Thanks for the yep. live chat, super chat donation. Thanks to all 2,200-plus of you who are joining in concurrently as we speak right now across all of our platforms. Thanks to you, partner, for uh, always bringing it. And this is your Wednesday Ravens Lunch Hour live stream. Get back to work now, right? I guess that's kind of how it works. What do we do now? <laughs> <laughs> we get back to, I get back to work, but it's a different work. <laughs> Post-show meeting. Let's do it. All right. See you guys. Thanks so much for being with us. And if you're interested in helping us out and also 
getting into the sleep mask world and supporting our brand that sponsors our show all off season long, go check out the link that we have included in the show notes below uh, at mantasleep.com. Talk soon, guys. Thanks.